those of you on the line, if you have a webcam on your computer and you would like us to be able to see you, feel free to activate that. We do see a few of you, and it's always nice. Um, up to you. If at any point you can't hear me, please wave your hand. You're all muted, but um, I will unmute you when we have discussion. Um, and if you're trying to talk and not getting through, wave at me and I will keep an eye on that. Um, I, I just want to say, disclaimer, this is the second time that we've used Zoom, so definitely this is not my expertise. Um, so I apologize in advance if we have any glitches. And we are recording the meeting and it will be available on the Percolator webpage. So I want to thank everybody who's here in person as well. We have a great meeting today. I'm going to just grab my clicker here. Uh, that's funny. Maybe the battery just <laughs> didn't work a minute ago. But that's okay. Let's just deal with this. Um, oh. You have to be on how am I? It's not. Bear with us one second. Ah, oh, beautiful. Thank you. Okay. I have no idea what he just said, but it was <laughs> so that's good enough for me. So, um, again, welcome to everybody. Thanks to all of you who drove out to Waltham to be with us. Thank you to everybody who's calling in from around the country. Um, we've got a little bit less than two hours here together. The last probably 20 minutes will be, um, we'll probably have finished up and those who want to stay and network can do that and others can, can head out or sign off. Um, we are going to um, go over any quick announcements that folks want to share. We're going to go over a few updates and then we're going to hear from the team at the South Shore Conservatory memory cafes of Duxbury and Hingham, Massachusetts. We're very excited to have a um, team of uh, expressive arts folks from various disciplines here to share with us. Um, you might want to grab a spot more towards that area. I'm with these. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and then we'll go over the results of the most recent percolator survey, which is how cafes are responding when guests are no longer able to attend due to death or disease progression. So we got a really great response on that survey, and I think um, it's always so helpful to just hear how other people are handling challenges. And I wanted to let you know our next quarterly meeting will be December 12th, and it'll be a Wednesday because we alternate Wednesdays and Thursdays as a way to help out folks who have their cafe on one or other date. Feel free to sit in back there, Debbie. That's, no, that's perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why that area didn't get filled in. There's nothing wrong with that area. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm really excited that on December 12th, we're going to have Jack Ramonte, who's an LGBT program specialist from Age Well Equality here in Jamaica Plain, who's going to be talking to us about how to help our cafes be welcoming places for the LGBTQIA community. And I'm looking for a cafe that wants to present. So if you haven't and you're interested, let me know. So um, this is a little bit of a new meeting format for us. We, this is only our second meeting where we're using Zoom. We are recording the meeting and the roll call is just gonna be quick. I just have kind of a list of where folks are from. Um, because introductions were just getting too long. Um, and we will continue to meet quarterly, alternating Wednesdays and Thursdays. Hey there. Hello. Welcome. So, live in person here in Waltham, uh, we have folks from about uh, 25 different cities and towns, and we are delighted to have you here. And from afar, we've got a lot of Massachusetts folks, and we have folks from um, I believe it's 12 different states, ranging from um, colder places like us here in New England all the way through Texas, um, Virginia. So we're just very excited to have you all on the line and eager to share because, <laughs> yay, <laughs> <laughs> Lori in Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
<laughs> yeah. it's, um, it's amazing to be able to compare notes when people are in different settings and have just really fresh and different ideas. So does anybody have an announcement that they would like to make about something new you try in your cafe that you want to share? Or if you have a specific question that you really want to get answered today, you can also say that. And I just ask, let's just try to keep it brief. So first I'm going to open the floor to folks in the room, and then I'm going to unmute everybody on the phone. So folks in the room, any announcements or questions? No? Okay. Now I'm going to attempt to unmute the phone. Let's see. Unmute all. Okay. Does anybody want to talk to us? I would love to share what we're doing in Rhode Island. Great, let's hear it. So we have officially filed paperwork with the state to make a nonprofit organization known as Rhode Island Memory Cafe. Um, and all I have to do is send a check and we're going to be sending it off to the um, IRS to make it a nonprofit. And we will be opening our ninth memory cafe later this month. That's amazing. And Lori, yeah. <laughs> Just remind us, Lori, when you started the first one, how long ago was that? It was a year ago, June. Wow. So that's really interesting. And so Lori has become a registered 501c3. So there may be other cafe people around the country that are interested in talking to her. And keep in mind, one way to connect is through the Google group, which I'll mention again in a minute. And also, if you're ever wanting to contact somebody who you hear from at these meetings, you can always send me an email and I can, I can do that. Thank you, Lori. Anybody else want to share an announcement? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and mute the phones for now, just so we don't get background noise, but we will make sure you can talk to us again soon. Um, that's it. Don't okay. Six four seven five three two seven. That's us. That's us. Okay. And now, Sorry, and now I I lost. Gonna re repeat herself. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. You good? Yep. All right. I'll come back. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for folks on the line. Okay. We realize you lost your sound there, but we should be all set from here on out. So a um, couple of updates here in Massachusetts. There's now about 115 memory cafes. That includes 
three cafes in Spanish, two in Portuguese, and one in Chinese. And the list is at our directory. And please continue to let me know if there are any changes to your cafe so that we can keep the roster current. Um, for everyone, uh, we do have now a dedicated web page for the percolator, which has all of our resource links and webinars and the toolkit and so forth. The Google group has launched, so I hope everybody has received an invitation to it. Um, the idea of the Google group is it gives you a chance to talk to each other without having to go through me. So a few people have posted questions or announcements to that list, and then folks are able to just um, be in touch. Some uh, organizations will not allow their email addresses to um, accept a Google group invitation. So if you haven't gotten it, or if you got it and you're having trouble accepting it, you can always let me know. And sometimes what we've had to do is someone will give me a different email address, like a personal email address, and I'll send the invitation to that one. It's kind of a pain, and I don't know why it's that way, <laughs> but it is that way. Um, our updated memory cafe toolkit is available, and it's on our website. Hi. Um, so feel free, it's, it's um, in English and Spanish. And let me know if you have any requests for our quarterly surveys or our meetings because it's always great to hear from you what you feel like you need to know. Um, so can I just push that door shut a little bit? Thanks. I've learned to really project, but that means that sometimes my colleagues are so happy when they're at work while I'm having a meeting. So what I would love to do now is to turn the floor over to our cafe presenters. And we have a wonderful team of six folks um, so Carrie O'Brien is here, who is a cafe facilitator and music therapist, and Amanda Riopel. Riopel. Yeah. Riopel. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> cafe facilitator and music therapist. Jocelyn Fu, music therapist. Caitlin Mazzilli, dance therapist. Lauren Kaufman, music therapy intern. And we have Eve um, Montague, who is the director of creative arts therapy. So. Um, if you folks want to, I don't know exactly how you want to do this, but if I could sort of get whoever's presenting to come where sure. I am. Sure. I'm going to split it up a little bit. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm actually going to ask Caitlin to start. We're all um, performers, musicians, therapists, so we're going to start with a little activity. Awesome. <laughs> Are you short? <laughs> People online, join in. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. If you want to attend the pleasure, would you rather that I do it? Um, we don't even need, 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 need to do Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll be ready whenever you <laughs> All right. So the camera is up this way, so you're going to need to be in the center, close to that third so CC line. right here. Okay. There you go. Oh, <laughs> hi, everybody. <laughs> Great. I'm Caitlin Mazzilli. I am a dance movement therapist from the South Shore Conservatory, and I've had the privilege of attending a number of memory cafes with SSC. And I would like to bring an activity that I use quite a bit in my memory cafes that I would like to see if you'd like to join me. This is an open invitation. If you prefer just to watch, that's okay, okay. too. This is very fun. I'm joining. This is very fun. Please do it. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to do is point to the sky.
together has been very successful and meaningful for our memory cafes. Mm -hmm. So thank you for participating. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to add that there's also that social component that happens in the action of, I'm going to look around the room mm -hmm. and I'm going to see who else is around. Um, and that's communication as well. So we're hitting a lot of different things. And then, this, I mean, I was looking around the room and everybody was smiling. Everybody was doing it, and so you also have that emotional component. So you're hitting physical movement, social connection, communication, nonverbal. Nobody has to speak to do that connection. Um, and you speak to the solid beat and the <coughs> entrainment as well? The solid beat and the entrainment? Can you speak to that? Uh, just everybody moving together is very powerful, um, and music has a regulatory effect. So if we're all moving together in the music, that helps to create community and solidify that communication, that social, social aspect. Did I miss anything? Either? The physical aspect for the individual with coordination and better breath and speech support. Absolutely. So a lot, one little thing, you know, it didn't seem like we were doing that much, but we touched on so many, so many aspects. So. Um, yeah, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. And if there was anyone who was just watching, there's value to just witnessing as well because our brains have these mirror neurons. So by me watching someone else dance, I have the experience of dance as well. So I want to <laughs> remind you that it's, it's valuable to, to be a witness as well. Thank you. So my name is Eve Montague, and I am the Director of Creative Arts Therapies at Social Conservatory. I'm a music therapist as well. Uh, as you see, we have a number of people who are with us today because we all participate in the Memory Cafes. I wanted to give you a really brief history, but we can advance the um, slides there, Beth, thanks. Oops. Or maybe not. Yeah, no, <laughs> there we go. Oh, look at you. Let's go. We'll bring everybody up. Um, that's who we have on our team, as you can see. Uh, we had an art therapist. They unfortunately, well, fortunately for them, moved on to um, their own business, but we do some consult have some consultant services. And then we have a yoga specialist um, with, who is trained in a very specific kind of yoga that we use with some of our participants as well. I have my back to you, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, you bet. So we originally were invited to provide the art component, um, a music component for local council on aging memory cafes, and it was done through um, a grant through Old Colony Elder Services. So we went out to about six different um, councils in our area and provided the music therapy interventions for them. Um, we also go outside of our area. We're often invited to provide dance and, and music therapy services there. And we thought, heck, we could do this. We should. We have nothing in our area for um, memory cafes. And we thought, we have the capacity to do this. We have some beautiful space. We have the, the skilled therapist to do this. So we began our um, first cafe in Hingham in January of 2018. And uh, we started our second cafe at our other campus in Duxbury in May of 2018. Um, we have a large multi-purpose room in our Hingham cafe. We'll actually talk a little bit about that. 
lots of natural light, um, beautiful open space. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we can really make it to what we need. And we have access to a beautiful grand piano in there as well. We are moving this cafe, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And then our Duxbury Cafe uh, is similar. We have this beautiful concert hall, has some beautiful natural light. Again, we have ways to make the space work for us in any way that our participants need it, and um, lots of room to spread out, or we can be very intimate. So it works very nice for us there. I'm going to let everybody else talk about this, the rest of it. I am going to jump ahead and just tell you that we are funded through family grants. We have one um, family um, who funds our Kingdom Grant of the Middleton Family Foundation. And they fund it because she is someone who is of a uh, conservatory family. Her husband um, uh, lived with Alzheimer's for a number of years. And when they were going through this journey, there was nothing available to them except things are going to get worse and worse for you. That's what they found when they went to support groups. They were talking with people who were um, really very challenged with people who were um, not doing well. And that was really tough for them to hear because this particular gentleman was doing okay. Um, but, you know, his mind was gone, but he, he was not aggressive, he was not verbally abusive, and, and so they were really looking for things that just didn't exist. So she was so excited to fund this for us. The other family foundation funds our um, Duxbury Foundation, uh, our Duxbury Memory Cafe, and they started doing it because they fund local organizations for health, wellness, and music. So we were able to get that grant as well. It's very local for us on both of these funders, but we're so, so grateful that we have it because there's no cost to our members and um, we're able to hold these. Right now we're on a monthly basis, so each cafe. I'm out of the way. <laughs> Thank you. Don't forget the camera. <laughs> Hello, everyone at home. I'm Amanda Riappel, one of the music therapists at the conservatory. So I'd like to talk about who participates and how they participate in our memory cafes. So we have individuals that are living with dementia, memory loss, Alzheimer's, um, seniors that are developmentally intellectually delayed. Uh, we have lots of family members coming to our memory cafes, also care partners that are loved ones as well. Um, as it says, maybe one in the same. Um, people, when we're participating in activities, are always encouraged to perform at the levels they're most comfortable. We don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable when they're at our memory cafes. So as Caitlin mentioned, you know, there's, there's an importance and beauty to being a witness. You don't necessarily have to do everything. Uh, at our memory cafes, we always provide refreshments, uh, and those are open for the, the full two hours. You're welcome to get a a drink or a muffin, whatever you like. Um, and we always ask, you know, ideas for themes. We generally will have a theme for each memory cafe and activities that go around. Um, when we have our therapists coming in for the last half hour, uh, last hour, sometimes they'll follow that same theme that we may have planned. Thanks, Amanda. Want to do the next one? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm Carrie O'Brien. Amanda and I are going to be switching off a little bit. Um, so as Amanda mentioned, uh, the first about an hour of the cafe is um, getting refreshments, um, catching up with everyone. We have uh, a lot of repeat attendees and they like to chat um, and it's, it's really wonderful. We're very lucky that we have those folks coming. Um, and then we have some sort of themed activity that we do. Um, and we have a list here of some of the themes that we've done that have been particularly successful with our group. One of them I stole from the presenter from the last <laughs> presenter. Um, it was an afternoon at the movies. And I cannot remember the name of the, the woman who shared that activity, but if, he, if she is out there, um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, uh, we got a big projector screen. Uh, I pulled clips of movies off of YouTube. And we had popcorn and snacks, and we chatted about these old movies. Um, and I had a selection of movies there, um, like a, a Casablanca, um, The Sound of Music, things like that. Um, we also have done Dream for the New Year, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more on the next slide. Um, we did a travel theme. We got a, a big world map that we talked about. Uh, where have you traveled? Where have you been? Um, where are your ancestors from? 
Um, and that was a really interesting discussion. I found out one of our attendees had been a nurse in, um, in Africa, in different countries in Africa when she was younger. Um, it, was really, it was really fascinating and it was a lovely discussion. Um, last year, um, in February, we did a Winter Olympics theme for the Winter Olympics. Um, uh, we did an intergenerational Thanksgiving. There's a picture from that later on in the presentation. Um, Caitlin was actually running that day for me. I do the, the one in hand. I was out on maternity leave, and so sadly I missed this intergenerational Thanksgiving. Um, but we have an earth-based preschool in our kingdom building, and the students from the preschool came over and did some activities with our family cafe attendees, and it was just wonderful. It was very um, successful yeah. yes. for both the children and the memory cafe participants, because some of the children have grandparents or other people in their family that may have some memory issues. So we were able to talk with the preschoolers and the memory cafe participants and caretakers, and it was a great learning experience for everyone. Thank you for filling in that, Caitlin. Um, that sound is the hot water oh. machine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to just keep it down. <laughs> You're in a You're musical. That's all the water is It's <laughs> unfortunate Caitlin wasn't up. You know, our dance movement person wasn't in front of the camera at that um, We also have done uh, A Day at the Beach, which, Amanda, if you want to fill that in, this was your idea. Um, so I thought of A Day at the Beach, you know, being summer. I had set up a bunch of decorations. I even brought uh, from my house a beach chair, and we had beach balls everywhere, which we incorporated into music therapy later. Um, and we also had, like, I had a beach towel, and the snacks were themed that way. So just kind of going with the summer theme. I was kind of inspired by, like, a night at the movies. It got me thinking of, oh, what do we do in the summer? Oh, a day at the beach. So if anyone wants any information on that, I'd be happy to share more detail. Absolutely. Any of these, we're, we're happy to share. Be my Valentine. I believe that was you as well. That was me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we had, that, that one was fun. We did uh, word search and crossword puzzles that were themed to uh, Valentine's Day. And actually, one of the, it was pretty funny. One of our group members, we were searching for a word, and um, the the word search was "I love you" in different languages, and "I love you" in English wasn't in the crossword. And he was very upset and was going to call and let them know. Uh, so, so it was a very funny, funny moment for everybody, and lots of fun. We can go to the next one. Um, we've also done uh, cookie making and decorating. Um, Caitlin, I believe, did that last fall, um, and then I did it again in the spring around Easter. I had, you know, bunny-shaped cookies and, and different things like that. Um, word puzzles, I believe the Be My Valentine had the word puzzle. We've done a lot of trivia around different things. Um, winter, summer, uh, a lot of patriotic trivia that's been really successful for us. Um, Musical bingo, Amanda has done. Yes, mm -hmm. we did that around the time where they just had the anniversary for Woodstock. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, one of our group members uh, borrowed the musical bingo bingo because she was going to have a party for uh, the anniversary of Woodstock. So it was actually very popular. We hadn't done musical bingo yet, but again, I I select songs that work for everyone's age, songs that are familiar to them, especially when they were maybe in their late teens, early 20s, or kind of going for songs like that. Um, and yeah, we've mentioned some of the, the very crafts we've done, the adapted sports, the, the Winter Olympics. Um, and exploration of historic events is the dream for the new year. Um, back in January, our memory cafe that I run um, landed around uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, and we did a combination of um, the listening to the I Have a Dream speech. Um, we had discussion about um, for, for those who were alive when that speech happened, you know, what do they remember about that time? Um, what do we feel about that speech today? What does that mean to us? And how can we, like, how does that fit into our lives? Um, and uh, 
we also came up with a wish for the new year. This is January, we're thinking about you know, resolutions and what we want in our lives. Um, and it was a really, really uplifting discussion. Caitlin was there that day to do dance movement therapy. And uh, we wrote our wishes on Snowflake, which is on the next slide. And I don't know how well you'll be able to see it. You're going to have to go up to the screen to really see it. Um, we put them up on the door. And it says, um, see the good in everyone, um, acceptance, spreading kindness, um, be understanding, another kindness, uh, sharing stories, um, keep on smiling. They were all just very positive messages that our attendees um, offered out. And it was just. It was really lovely. Uh, it worked really nicely. Um, so, um, as you've probably gathered from the, the themes and activities that we use, we, we make them pretty varied, and I imagine most of us do. Um, but since uh, Amanda and I are both creative arts therapists, we're always trying to see like how much creative arts can we get in there? Mm -hmm. um, like how many different elements can we bring in? Um, so that's, that's evident in our themes and our activities, but also mm -hmm. the creative arts therapies component, uh, the second half of the, the cafe when we have the guests come in to uh, do music therapy or dance movement therapy, um, that's where this is. Um, so for music therapy, um, that could be singing, instrument play, conducting, playing hand chimes. We've got these lovely Suzuki hand chimes that are very easy to hold. And all you have to do to play them is give them a swing just like this. Uh, we do a lot of improvisation, drumming, call and response. Um, I don't need to read this whole slide because I know everybody here can see that. Um, but we're finding all of these different elements, just like Caitlin's presentation at the beginning. How much can we get folks to to participate, how are they going to participate? Can we can we get some movement into their bodies? Can we get them socializing, communicating? I'm trying to turn so everybody can see that I got And uh, Amanda, if there's anything that you want to add about that, I feel like I've been talking for a bit. Oh, but. I completely agree with you. As you can see, there's many different things that we do with our folks, and we're just we're reaching as much as we can to reach anyone, even if it's like a small gesture or a large gesture. <laughs> Um, so we have goals uh, with our memory cafes as we do in our everyday work. So goals are to retain, maintain, reinforce, and use what you got. I like that. Use what you got in the areas of physical, social, emotional, communication, cognitive, and of course, music, dance, and art. Uh, we focus on areas such as coordination, speech volume, and speed breath support, choice making, control, self-worth, confidence, problem solving, sharing stories, recognizing self in space and time, active music making, sequencing patterns, executive function, creativity, stress reduction, community building. Just to name a few. <laughs> Just a few things. Just a few things. Yeah. So, yeah. So these are the things that are are just slightly different than if you have a musical entertainer who comes in. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at these things and adapting the activity as they move along. That's what we're doing because that's as therapists, that's what we're trained to do. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking to really move and shape um, the arts medium, whatever we're using, to meet these large goal areas and those focus areas. It's about um, interaction and engagement and meeting people where they are when they come in. Um, so, thank you, Eve. Should we go to the next? I sure. Yeah. Okay, so this is our intergenerational Thanksgiving photo. Um, there's Caitlin up there in the pil pilgrim hat. <laughs> <laughs> and Amanda was there for music therapy that day. Um, Caitlin's but, hat says it all. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it does. Um, and each child wrote what they were grateful for on the feathers, and then the memory cafe participants helped them glue the feathers onto the turkeys. <laughs> it was really wonderful to watch that. <laughs> Everyone just coming together at the table and putting the activity together. It was beautiful. And this picture also gives you a, a, a bigger view of our space and um, for our hang of memory cafe, nice open room. The piano is the thing in the back behind Caitlin and Amanda. Um, so we've got this nice 
wonderful space there. Um, and this is also from the Hickam Memory Cafe. Um, <laughs> Your baby? You have to. That's my baby. Um, <laughs> for our December cafe. <laughs> um, by the way, that's an suit my mother in law purchased uh, the weekend after she found out I was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this was in December, um, and I brought my son Jack, who was not quite three months old, in to, uh, to visit our attendees. and. That day, we just had uh, one gentleman come with his daughter. That's um, uh, and they're longtime attendees. And uh, that day, um, the the gentleman in the middle uh, was uh, he had his head down. He was starting to fall asleep. Um, and then I walked in with Jack, and his daughter said he just lit up. <laughs> he brought his head up, and it was like he woke up. He was smiling, he was, you know, talking to him. Um, we had him hold him a little bit later with some help from his daughter and just the glow on his face. It was just wonderful. Um, and I love the look on Eve's face. She was there to do mm -hmm. music therapy and she was playing some, some holiday tunes and just, you can see from her expression just how delighted we all were. <laughs> <laughs> So we talked about this. It gives you a sense, though, um, of what our, our funders are doing and why they're doing it and what it pays for. So we have the facilitators who are Carrie and Amanda, and then um, the therapists who come in and provide that therapy piece separate from what the facilitators would do that day. And then it also pays for our materials and refreshments. Um, so to get a sense of um, how our folks are doing, if they're, you know, get some feedback about the cafes, we like to try and check in every single month. Um, you know, ask them, what is, you know, how are they feeling about coming? Um, we want them to feel seen, and we want it to be something that they feel comfortable coming to, and they want to come back. Um, so as I mentioned before, we've got a bunch of folks who are rich. Uh, attendees and that's wonderful um, and we do a lot of uh, email follow-up for those we've not seen in a while uh, I know I personally want to do more phone calls checking in because I think that's just a little bit more personalized and not everyone um, checks their email as often I think um, and then um, I believe occasionally we've gotten some input uh, that we've not requested, you know, not somebody that we approached, but somebody would um, contact us to give some feedback. Um, and we've not done formal evaluations yet, um, but we may in the future, we may add that in. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is how we get the word out. And Amanda, sure. feel free to, to hop in anytime. Uh, so getting the word out, of course, we use social media. Um, Student Observatory, uh, they have their own person that will put things up on Facebook, will spread the word around. Um, of course, as Carrie mentioned, we use emails, but would like to increase our calling just because calling someone is way more personal than an email. Uh, and then our partnership with Alzheimer's Association of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, the regional meetings, and obviously the resource page to get a hold of us. Um, hopefully, we're trying to get the word out more. Looks <laughs> like we have some questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, so if you want to finish your slides, yeah, okay. and then we'll take, we'll take we'll time questions right? from the chat bar oh. and we'll open up the phone. Perfect. That sounds good. I have to remember every time I have to click on my slides again. There we go. Okay. Um, so, attendance has been a bit of a challenge. Um, we, although we have people that love coming and they keep coming every month, there's not that many of them. Uh, and that's true for both of our locations. Um, and we're not sure why, um, because we, we know that the people are out there and the need is there, um, but how can we get them to come? Um, so we're trying to figure that out. Um, and we're open to, uh, to thoughts and suggestions because we want to, you know, we want people to, to come to this. Um, and also, you know, a lot of people are just, they don't want to speak up or they're afraid of bringing their, their loved one who has Alzheimer's or dementia out there. Uh, a couple months ago, I had a woman come in to my cafe 
um, and says that, you know, my husband, I left him in the car. I think he's too tired to come in. I just wanted to see what this was about. And I said, oh, you know, please bring him in. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't need to do anything. He can just be in the room. And she, she said, oh, no, 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 no. He's just way too tired. We had an outing before this. Um, and I encouraged her to come back the following month, you know, and I emphasize that, you know, really it's fine. However you participate, however you want to participate, you can just come and be. Um, I told her about the one in Dexter that Amanda runs, um, and we haven't seen or heard from them since. Um, so it's just, it's a little, it's a little heartbreaking because you want those folks to feel like they can be a part of the community. Um, Another issue is that the Hingham campus is uh, it's beautiful and wonderful. It's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it's, it's way back in, in a residential neighborhood. It's kind of hard to find our building. Um, so uh, we're actually moving that location starting at our cafe next week. We're going to be in, um, in Hanover um, by the mall in this lovely space. So, um, and it's in a partnership with the YMCA. So we're, we're trying to build on that as well. And we're hoping people will be able to get to us more easily and they'll see, they'll see us mm -hmm. and feel comfortable coming in. So, you know, fingers crossed that, uh, <laughs> that it'll work. And that's just our contact information if anybody is looking for therapy kind of things or in for more information about it. We also know where all the therapists are throughout the state, so we can help you out. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We've got a bunch of questions. I think. Um, let's go ahead and take the questions from the chat first, and then I will open up the phones as well. Um, so one question is, do you play musical bingo, or how do you play musical bingo? Okay. Oh, I don't want you to me. that. Okay. Uh, so I developed musical bingo with a young adult group. I would use a three by three grid, and basically I would go with themes, you know, I would do summer bingo. So I would find songs that reminded you of summer, I had to do with summer, and I would, using Microsoft Word, I would just create a grid and type a combination of song titles. So when we would have that in our session, I would mix up the playlist I create, do it on shuffle, and working together, we would try to identify the song titles. So that's what I mean with musical bingo. It's kind of a take on traditional bingo. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had our memory cafe folks say, this is too easy. So I, I we just did a five by five grid. <laughs> so the traditional uh, 25 spaces with the free space and they loved it. Again, I, I always choose songs that work for the ages. So if I'm seeing a lot of folks that are you know now in their 80s, I'm looking for songs for when they were in their, their early 20s. Songs that they're really going to remember and it's going to trigger those memories and then it can also get a discussion going. Uh, and please feel free to email me for, I can really give you detailed information on musical. Or Eve's email is up there and if you email her, her um, she can uh, forward it to us. I would send you a, you know, a template of the bingo sheet that I use. I'm happy to help in any way. I just unmuted the phone, so if anybody on the phone wants to jump in, you're welcome to. Um, and I'll go ahead and read the next question from chat. Does anyone have the cards slash music that they would like to share with the group while you reinvent the wheel? So I think you just answered Oh, I did. That. I'm happy to share. I've done so many different themes, so I'm happy to share any of those with you. And I believe your information um, well, Eve's email is right here, um, yeah. so can they contact you? Thank you, contact you for, um, individual emails are the same as mine. Mm -hmm. First initial, last name, at. Dot Rehabilitation. Okay, great. Okay. This work is part of your paid position, or is it volunteer work? Much more structured with goals as such than your typical cafe. That's a great question. Um, so uh, Amanda and I, as facilitators of cafes, um, that is 100% uh, part of our paid position. We get uh, paid to, to plan and run these. Um, and then our, our other folks who come in, so Caitlin, Jocelyn, 
um, and Amanda, if you guys <laughs> my cafe, me. you know, yeah. the folks that we come in to do the creative arts therapies component, they are paid um, their hourly rate to come in and do, and it, Eve is coming around to uh, <laughs> to assist me with answering this question. No, no, you're, you're, you're right. I just, I just wanted to clarify a little yeah. bit that um, our faculty are, um, we really don't have full-time positions at the conservatory, except for a very small amount. So everybody is in on a contract basis, and so we add this to contracts so that we have people uh, who make a good salary and a, and a good paycheck every pay period. Um, but it definitely is part of the job. As a, as a creative arts therapy department, there are some things that I ask for from all of us as therapists, and there needs to be goals and objectives. So it is very structured um, in some ways, and at this point, we're doing volunteers. Um, we are doing it all based on the people that are, are employed by the territory right now. I wonder if I can just uh, ask a question to sort of jump off that a little bit, because I'm just so impressed with the richness of the uh, kinds of programming that you're presenting, and clearly for training as therapists bring levels of to what you're doing that are really you know, profound. And I'm just wondering, because it's unusual to have a team like that running a memory cafe, if there's any kind of pearls of wisdom that you could suggest, you know, and it could even be maybe try to, you know, find it in your budget to have a consultation with a creative arts therapist. But I know that's not going to be possible everywhere. We also are lucky. We have Leslie University here in Greater okay. Boston, which trains a lot of creative arts, uh, arts therapists. Everybody has that resource around the country. So do you have any sort of help um, people without that training do at least some piece of what you're doing? That's a big question. <laughs> that's kind of a big yeah. Question, but I so, figured I'd ask. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. great. Yeah. We're really available as a resource. We're happy to talk to people and to give you thoughts and ideas on activities. Uh, are you therapists? No. So we don't expect that piece, but we don't own the music and dance. We all share in that in that joy, right? So I think for us, it's. Um, kind of um, providing consultation, and we would, can do it in an informal way to, to help you if you want to get a little deeper, a little broader with some of the things you might be doing. Um, you're welcome to come and see us. You're welcome. We're, we're open. Our, our memory cafes are wide open for people who might want to come and, and join it. And we don't want to ask you to know. We want you to come on and join us. But we're happy to have you as a guest to come in and see what we're doing and then to steal some of those ideas. We, as therapists, are trained to steal ideas. So we have no problem if you steal ideas. Um, and there is the occasion where we could come out, um, depending, and I'm sort of the budget person, we could come out and go, yeah, you know what, we'll do this for you uh, because we're, we're, we're good neighbors. So I'm happy to engage in those conversations, just so you know, okay? If that helps. Yeah, that's great. Those are really good ideas to help others who maybe don't have a trained therapist on their staff to yep. ask us some of your knowledge. Go ahead, Deb. To that point, I'm just curious what um, the backgrounds are for the therapist that they would engage with somebody with a dementia versus the general population or children. Or So as therapists, we are trained to work with a variety of populations. Um, including, you know, from very young and early intervention, through individuals with uh, ASD, developmental delays, medical physical challenges, and dementia. Dementia is a huge area for music therapists being trained. So it's all done through schoolwork and then practical application. Right now we have an intern school where their internships include work in all these areas to so gain that experience. Uh, with us um, to, to build a skill before you can then write a board exam, which assesses sort of your head knowledge on these areas, including dementia. With the Alzheimer's Association, we also, because we're in a continuing ed and development for all our areas, and while some of us specialize in certain areas, um, 
there are some of us who have gained our experience by working with someone who's very experienced in that area and then learning over time. So have you developed your some of your curriculum based on dementia or do you find that it's pretty broad the things that you do are applicable? I think a lot of it is very applicable because we are we are trained to be flexible and to continually assess in the moment and to adapt for that specific need. We want to know the population basic needs and characteristics, obviously, because they're going to be different than somebody on the autism spectrum. But um, I think the skills that we learn for the flexibility and um, the ability to assess and change midstream is very different than what a music educator has and or what a, a um, an educator might have. We are trained specifically for that. Um, and we talked about this before, but our, our big thing is meeting people where they are. Um, so each individual is an individual, we meet them where we are, and um, yeah, like you said, this is just, this is what we're trained to do. This is very, uh, very natural for us. So I hope that, that answers your question. I do have one thing to add as well. I received my training from Leslie University as a dance therapist, but there are also workshops that you can go to for one day or one weekend. I actually have one right in front of me uh, presented by Donna Newman Bluestein. In November, she's going to be leading a workshop on bringing dance to frail elders and people with dementia. So if anyone is interested, I'd be happy to share more information. So you might not be a dance movement therapist, but you could take a one weekend training and learn a tremendous amount of skills. I've taken this specific training and it was very helpful for me, so I'd be happy to share that as well. Thank you, and I have that information too. If you want to contact me, Donna is wonderful. She's been the guest artist at my cafe several times. I think that's a great idea. And I also just want to say, Lori LeBay, um, chatted in um, mariasplace.com, tons of resources, um, for a variety of levels. You get a shopping list and videos showing the activity and how to adapt for different levels to craft, meditation, exercise, etc. So that's mariasplace.com. And here's a different question. Um, how does the Alzheimer's Association chapter support you? So I don't know if you have particular so one of the ways is that um, we use their resource page and we, we advertise memory cafes on their resource page. And then when people call their hotline, that comes up if people are looking for specific things like that. The other piece that's been really invaluable, I think, for us is some of their trainings that are now available to us. And we don't have to pay the big prices because we're doing, we are in a true partnership. We are sponsoring um, one of their ELS talks. Um, on October 1st in our facility. We've used, we've allowed our facility to be available to them for some other trainings. And so we're trying to do this give and take. So we get some training from them. We give them some great space. Um, we learn a lot of stuff. We're bronze sponsors in their uh, Walk to End Alzheimer's this coming weekend. So it's those kind of things that we do. A little money here, a little money there, but most of it is just really in, in true exchange. Thank you. So I just, we were getting some background noise and some echoing in the room, so I did just put the phones back on mute. Um, I think I didn't get everybody. I'm trying to not mute myself. <laughs> um, so maybe folks who are on Zoom, if you want to type questions or comments into the chat box, that would be helpful. Um, I had another question, which I think um, probably comes up with a lot of cafes, and I'm very curious with, with the thoughtfulness that you bring to this. How do you address the issue when um, your guests, their antenna goes up and they fear that they're being asked to do something childish, particularly things like, you know, cutting the snowflakes? I have found this comes up more with visual arts than with other modalities, but it comes up. And I'm just curious what your approaches are to dealing with that. Uh, well, with the, the activity that involves the snowflakes, I will say I cut those snowflakes before the cafe. Um, and so they were already cut and ready so that folks could just write on them. And some of them chose not to write on them, and so Caitlin and I did that. 
Um, we've had a few people, um, a few men, um, who don't want to do like arts and crafts based stuff as much. Um, that's been less of an issue for me. I really only have typically one man that shows up. Um, and his daughter, he's the man uh, that you saw in the picture with my son, um, and his daughter, you know, helps him to, to create these, these things. Um, but it's actually, it's been a little bit since I've had somebody have that reaction to me. Can you speak to that? I honestly haven't had too much of that. And if I did, part of my approach would be it's, it's completely, oh, sorry. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, with activities, we, we always say we meet our folks where they're at. If they truly don't want to do an activity based on how they feel, it's really fine. Uh, we want everyone to feel comfortable about expressing themselves. And if they feel the activity is a childish activity, um, I would just let them know it's always a choice if they want to participate. Um, I just, I don't want to say too much because I've actually never had it happen. I, I know it can happen. I have, I have had this happen. Okay. <laughs> um, I will say too, when I did the Winter Olympics, I had us doing sports. Um, so we did like a beanbag toss with the curling. I can't remember what else because this was like a year and a half ago. Um, and I did have a couple people at that cafe be like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and I would say, okay, great. You can be in our audience. You can be our crowd during the and, and they got into that. They were like, okay, I don't have to get up. I don't have to do this thing in front of everybody, but I can sit back and watch. Uh, so mm -hmm. just talk to me. Yeah, I've had sim similar experiences where one time I brought my big rainbow parachute and for one of the memory cafe participants, that was very babyish and also, I think, overstimulating for him. So we took it away. <laughs> if something is not working, I change it. And now I am very mindful where if someone is, is clearly distressed, I, I make the activity a little bit shorter and, and keep it moving. Because I don't, just because I came in with this plan that I'm going to do this, this, and this, we have to sometimes change our plans. Mm -hmm. So there are times where I said, well, let's try it for just this one song, and then we'll put it away and do something different. Because I, I never want people to feel that they're forced to do something they don't want to do or something that's babyish. So I try to take their feedback in the moment and say, okay, well, we're, let's, let's make it a short activity and move on. So that, that was my approach. And sometimes I like to beat them to the punch. Um, there's some instruments that I like to use that have some beautiful sound, and they're really user-friendly, but they look like toys. They look like children's toys. So I will present them, and I go, look, these things look kind of babyish. I know that. Um, but the sound is really cool. And I'll play it, and they'll get the sound, and that wins over most of the time that it looks kind of babyish. But I'm going to readily admit, there are a couple things that I use because they're so easy to use and create this beautiful different sound that we want folks to try to experience that I just beat them to the punch and go, yep, babyish, I'm with you. You're right on. Like, and my case, I'm, let's do one thing, and then we're done with it. If I can substitute, I will, but there are a couple of bell things that I'm thinking in my head that I just love, but they look like toys. You know, they look like little kid toys. I, I know that. I'm always looking for other options. Uh, I open, once again, just to see if anybody has anything they want to ask or share on the line. Uh, Beth, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, we can hear you. Hear you. Hey, hey, everybody. I'm Marion Popsfield, and I'm totally creative also. <laughs> um, hey, hi. <laughs> Some lessons that we have learned in my memory cafe that I facilitate here in Topfield is um, number one, um, because I am the facilitator, I try to have a couple of volunteers um, who can help identify individuals who may not be participating in the group activity um, who can kind of go up to those folks. And usually it's only one person in the group who may need a volunteer 
to, you know, meet them where they're at and say, hey, how's it going for you? And, you know, in particular, with an arts and crafts activity that we had that included um, using some pens to write down our, you know, wishes and thoughts on paper, um, I received the feedback that the pens were hard to use. Somebody, this one person said, these pens are hard to use. Can we have markers or crayons? So sometimes when you're doing arts and crafts, um, it might be a nice uh, option to have different writing utensils based on people's motor abilities to grasp and write. <laughs> Another concern about the arts and crafts activity for some is that it is hard to meet everybody where they're at when they're doing one type of activity. And there are going to be people in the group who can no longer write. And again, that's another chance to have a volunteer um, maybe take a walk with the person or ask them what's special to you or whatever the topic is and have a one-on-one -on -one opportunity for that person. Um, so those are just some of my experiences that I've had trying to bring arts to people. And then some people have challenges with the arts, either based on their motor ability um, or, or they, their perception or their bias that this is too childish. Thank you very much, Mary. I'm going through and muting it again because we're getting a lot of background sounds. So um, we've got a couple more comments on chat. We'll take those and then we're going to thank the folks from SSC and move on to the next part of our agenda. So let me just see if I can finish muting folks. So if you do have a question or comment, please go ahead and type it into the chat box. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid with muting myself. Anyway, um, I think we're almost through the list here. Okay, um, so here is a comment during our icebreaker conversation. This is from Live Well in Connecticut. Um, during our icebreaker conversation, the conversation took a turn to a deep share and continued to head in a heavy direction. I redirected us and suggested to the group that we absolutely need to support each other. We are not a support group. So, you know, there are all kinds of things that can come up where you might feel this is great, let's roll with this. And sometimes you might feel this isn't quite something that we can address. Um, you know, and I think every group is different. Yeah. And you, you know, you can kind of see on someone's face, sometimes people overshare, mm -hmm. or they express a lot of feeling, and then they feel vulnerable. And you as the facilitator might decide to sort of protect them by kind of um, acknowledging them and then helping the topic to shift a little bit if it feels overwhelming. So that's a helpful point. Yeah. Um, and then let's see, here in Burlington, Vermont, we use medical student volunteers in the role Great. you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. absolutely. Any other comments, questions, folks who want to um, chat something in, anybody in the room? I have a question around how do you try to invite more um, racial and gender diversity into your groups? I mean, I think it can be hard, I can imagine if there is someone who might be experiencing early onset Alzheimer's who might be in their 40s, and then having someone who's in their 80s, I mean, the music is vastly different uh, for those age groups, but then also kind of addressing and bringing in people of different racial uh, backgrounds as well. Mm. I know in our experience, this is one of our biggest frustrations. We sit in two very waspish town. <laughs> and um, while there is some diversity, there is limited diversity. And we are, um, we 
bill ourselves as an inclusive and accepting, welcoming community and try to get that word out through our language and our open doors and when people meet us, that sort of thing. Um, it's a tough nut for us to crack right now just by where we're situated. Our, our newer cafe moving to the newer location is going to be in a little more diverse neighborhood, if you like, and we're hoping to open that up, that we will have it opened up um, because of our location and we will see a, a, a diversity. Um, the easy answer to, your, to this part of it is, is that when we have a real range of age and music kind of thing, we find something in the middle, like we do a lot of drumming or we do a lot of bell play where we do like blues progressions and um, songwriting, those sort of things that kind of bridge and arch over lots of different ages. And so that's just assessing the group every time. But the whole inclusivity is, um, for us, it's a big challenge just because of where we sit. Um, we're on the South Shore of Massachusetts in two very exclusive towns. That's the bottom line right there. And there's very limited transportation. Yeah. Like public yeah. transportation. Yeah. So but maybe the Hanover will have more options. Correct. Yeah. 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 So that's what we're hoping. I didn't answer the inclusive. We're working hard to be sure, however, that our inclusive language is in place and that we are welcoming and open so that when people do find out about us, we want those people to feel okay coming. It's so it's like a an organization that said they were really welcoming, but the actual group wasn't <laughs> oh, oh, no, that's not good. <laughs> so like they were yeah. trying to get people and they would get there and the other people that were at the cafe were, were not welcome, mm. which is a separate but similar challenge mm -hmm. um, in kind of how to make it safe and welcoming for everyone. We had some, some concerns when <clears throat> uh, we had um, some individuals with developmental delays who have joined our memory cafe, some of the older folks who are experiencing dementia. And in all honesty, we weren't sure how the other members of the cafe would accept that. There hasn't been an issue with that population, which so far, <laughs> uh, which is great. We're, we're thrilled about that. Um, but I can see, you know, we haven't had that major challenge yet. Thank you so much for raising that um, question, Amy. And um, there's so much to say about that. And just as sort of a general statement, I mean, what we know, and there's more and more scholarship and documentation about that, is that our federal, state, and local governments have pursued policies for, you know, since for 400 years that have created seg right, residential yeah. segregation inequality of resources and opportunities and horrific discrimination and exploitation mm -hmm. of black and brown people. So, you know, obviously we're all living within that context. It's not like any person here chose that or created it, but we are all part of this um, situation that exists in our country and there's no quick or easy fix. I think you know one thing so important in, in what both of you were sharing is that given all the barriers to people sometimes trying a group that they're not sure is going to be welcoming, we want it to be very welcoming when they do get there. We might have one chance for, for folks to come in and say, oh, this does or does not feel like a safe place for me. And I think what you're raising is something we should look at as a group, you know, can we have a, a a session where we talk about how do we negotiate it if there are issues within the guests and, and people are not welcoming toward one another. Um, I want to mention that in the revised toolkit there's a section on inclusivity um, that addresses what some cafes have done and um, next our next meeting we're going to have a specialist talking about LGBTQ inclusivity in particular but um, yeah, this is, this is huge. One thing that comes up in my cafe where most of the guests who attend are white is that a lot of the professional caregivers who attend are immigrants, people of color, and I have found it to be really um, wonderful to make sure I communicate to them that they're guests too and that the coffee and the refreshments are for them and the discussion is for them 
And we've had wonderful moments where people have shared about the background that they come from, often it's from another country, and it's just, um, you know, there's all kinds of diversity. Sometimes we don't necessarily notice in our own group where that may be. Um, so I'm going to stop talking. Anybody else want to respond to that or any, any other issue? Just really quickly, when you're dealing with a population like frontal temporal, we had a guy with an English accent, white, and the guy with FTD said, oh, something about his accent, and he would not come back to the cafe anymore. <laughs> his wife said he was so upset by that, but it was where he was. He had been yeah. coming to the cafe for a long time, and he had really, I think it was a combination of his decline cognitively. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we also have to be aware that people don't have a filter, mm -hmm. and how do we react to the situation? I didn't know about it until after. Um, and tried to encourage the wife to, um, to come back, but she said he's just not ready to come back. This is really hard stuff. It is, and there always are going to be situations where it doesn't work out. And so I think for all of us, we just have to keep learning and moving forward and, 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 <coughs> and, and keep, you know, trying to do better. But, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of people with a lot of different needs that um, come to memory cafes. We have a question which may be a separate topic, and you may have already talked about it um, before, so forgive me if you have, but did you already address kind of how to deal with the loss of a member at a cafe? No, we're going we're gonna to shift to that. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. So just another thing, you had brought up um, your issues um, trying to get people to come, mm -hmm. which is a perennial topic here, yeah. and I think it was two quarters ago. We um, addressed that. We had a survey about that. And I'm always happy to share the slides with anybody who wants. Just one little nugget, you know, in my observing what is happening in different cafes. There are a couple of cafes that have just had enormous attendance from the beginning, just huge, and it hasn't abated. And one thing I'm seeing that they did is really find ways to use other community members as ambassadors to the cafe. Mm -hmm. Because we know that word of mouth is the most mm -hmm. significant way that people come to cafes. So they've had events that are for people who are not necessarily planning to come to the cafe themselves, but are maybe curious. Yeah, I'll come find out what this thing is. There's food, there's music. You know, it's, it's maybe paired with something that would make them want to come like an educational program. And then they learn what the cafe is, and they are told, your job now is to go out and tell people you know who might benefit. Hey, I went to this program, and I heard about this neat thing. Would you go with me sometime, or you might want to check it out? Because it's otherwise people hear about it, and they say, well, what is it? Or that's not for me, and they just glaze over, and that's it. So, but it's a, it's a huge topic in and of itself. So thank you all for your comments and questions. Let's give another big hand to Thank you so much. And um, I am going to move on to the second and last part of our meeting. I'll try to get myself in front here. I'm going to leave the chat box up. I'm going to kind of make it a little smaller, but that way we will see if someone comments. Interesting. All right, yeah. So I think I want to make it smaller so that we see the new comments. Okay. Thank you. So if anybody sees a new comment, holler and I'll be doing I think there is oh. one. Oh, see, there's a difference of different. Okay. <laughs> Do caregivers of different cultures bring their personal life experiences to cafe discussions, including visual and music? Yes, go ahead. Um, I just got an email the other day from a um, husband of one of the participants, and he informed me that he's a musician, he's been doing it for years, and he'd like to bring it to the cafe. Um, and he has friends who also play, so I'll make sure. That's great. So 
So that's another way that you can welcome and bring in different cultures, different languages is through your guest facilitator. So it might be a, one of your guests who is sharing something or it might be somebody who you seek out. But that can be another way that you really um, try to encourage people of different backgrounds to come. So the latest survey was how cafes respond when guests stop attending due to death or disease progression. Whoops getting my work out today. <laughs> All right. So we had 81 responses, which was awesome. Thank you, everybody. A little more than half from Massachusetts, or almost two-thirds Massachusetts, and um, a third from outside Massachusetts. Most of the respondents have been running their cafe for at least a year. Um, and then it breaks down from there. Um, so most of the cafes meet monthly, the great majority. Only 20% meet on a different schedule. Um, some meet more often, some meet less often. Um, a third meet in a senior center, 12% in a library, 12% house of worship, 7% in adult day program, and then there's a whole host of other kinds of locations. Museum, restaurant, community center, nature center, private garden, municipal or corporate building, um, continuing care community or other aging services provider. We know here in Massachusetts there's a bowling alley now, so there's <laughs> lots of different places. Um, so in general, what I saw as I was going through the responses and the comments is that there's two schools of thought. One school of thought is you don't want to emphasize loss. You don't want to remind guests of what's coming down the pike. And the other school of thought is kind of the opposite. It's you want to share and normalize death and disease progression and have concrete ways for guests to support one another during transitions. And I'll just say, in my personal view, because I have the clicker right now, and I'm <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I worked in hospice for several years before I came here to this position. And what I came to believe is there really is no one right way. It's so individual and it's also very culturally based, not just culture with a big C, but also sort of subculture, the culture of the community. So, you know, I think you have to find your own set point and you have to get a sense of how people are responding. But the comments you're going to hear do kind of fall into those two different camps. Um, and a few people also raise questions about outreach and attendance. So once again, feel free to contact me about that and I can share the material that we have. So the first question was, when somebody stops attending, does your cafe do something specific to reach out? And um, the great majority do. Um, so about half of the respond, more than half of the respondents do, do reach out. Um, and for about half, it's after people miss two or three sessions, and um, some do it after one missed session. And so there are some comments that I pulled out for each of these questions. Uh, so all guests receive a call monthly at some cafe. Uh, one of the folks said, we are a small, close-knit cafe, and all participants share contact information or are in frequent touch. So that's interesting. So there are some cafes where actually the participants have um, share contact info. And another person said, whether I check in depends how long they've been coming and if there's a health issue. So it's case by case. So we know we don't know, we're not always going to find out what happened. Um, but the respondents said, usually they do. So, you know, always not that many, but usually people will find out what happens. Um, and then, then, you know, is this a major issue? And for a minority of respondents, it's a big issue for seven of the people who responded. And then a bigger group, 29, said it's somewhat of an issue. So I also did a, a, a analysis of how that fit with how long the cafe's been running. And they're pretty closely connected. So I think it's safe to assume the longer your cafe runs, the more likely this is to crop up for you at some point, just because disease progression being what it is. And you know, most cafes find over time that um, people get close and it, it starts to matter a lot if someone's not there. Thank you. Um, let's see, the comment. Let's see. 
When one of my participants was in the hospital, we called to check in during the group. Oh wow, right during the during the cafe. Um, also, we did the same thing when another member didn't come because of, of a fall. So that's interesting, calling right from the cafe. Whoops. <laughs> The comments are great because I think, you know, there's a lot of richness just in the different specific ways people handle things. If a guest with dementia passes away or is no longer able to attend, do you invite the care partner to continue attending? Um, 26 of the respondents said always. A um, few more said depends. Depends on the circumstances. So I don't know, you know, if folks have a routine around that. It's, Sounds like it's a bit all over the map. And, and you know, not that many care partners do continue to come. Some do. I know in my cafe we have a gentleman whose wife died, and he has been a regular um, for about two years now on his own, which is wonderful. Um, but, you know, more typically it's they don't come or they might come once in a while. Chat, okay. I'm going to actually keep going through the slides a little bit and then come back to the comment. Um, so when a cafe guest stops coming due to disease progression, do you have a specific way that you acknowledge the loss? So now we're getting sort of to the, the meat of this topic. So only 11, only 11 of the respondents out of that group of 81 do have a specific way. So the great majority do not. Um, so I think this is a new, a new issue for a lot of cafes to be dealing with. Um, and we're going to talk about how cafes are dealing with it. Just see, we have never had a care partner continue after the death of their spouse. So it just depends. Curious, show of hands in the room, how many have had somebody continue on their own? So just so three of us in the in the room out of about 20 people. So um, how do you acknowledge the loss? So now we're down to that smaller group, group of 11 respondents who, who do do something specific. Um, several mentioned the importance of having permission to share so that, you know, it's important to check in with that um, care partner and make sure that they want people to know. Um, six of them make some sort of announcement. Three send a card or one person sends a cookie platter. Um, in one case, the card is signed by cafe guests, so that's a much more formal kind of active step to circulate a card. Um, and one has a hanging cloth where people can put initials, which is me. So I'm going to show you that <laughs> in a minute. Um, whoops. Okay. So comments about if and how to share. So I just pulled out what I thought were some of the the comments that were helpful. Um, I don't share this information with folks attending um, unless I'm specifically asked by someone. Then I do share what information I have, keeping in mind not to share very personal information. So there's always going to be some information you might hold back because you feel like it's not for general discussion. I only share information with permission of the care partner. Whether making an announcement or not also depends how regular their attendance was. So some folks might just show up once in a while and don't feel like they're really embedded in the group. Um, oh, I keep doing this. <laughs> okay. So we have shared information participants ask on an individual basis. Now this person says, I do wonder if caregivers are afraid to ask because it may be in their foreseeable future. So that gets to that emotional issue, and it's not the same for everybody, and it's not the same for that same person every day. It depends. But, you know, sometimes people will choose not to open up the topic. When someone stops attending to the health reasons, everyone in the cafe realizes, but we haven't had a formal discussion. Um, and this person is saying, I struggle to know if I should announce it. Why remind them of what's coming down the road? So that's a concern. And the other person says, really a case-by-case -case basis. Some people would want others to know. Others would rather not have the information shared. So if there is going to be sharing, there were lots of different ideas about how to do it. Um, this person says, if the spouse who is, if the, the surviving spouse um, requests it, 
I email the rest of the group with the news. I rarely make an announcement at the cafe because I don't want to draw attention, but that person does send an email. If the care partner gives permission, we do make an announcement, and sometimes the care partner opts to come and discuss it with participants. And the last comment um, to step me on, I gained permission from the family caregiver to share, and then I allow time for discussion and encourage members to keep in touch with the couple during that transition. So that's a much more active approach. Again, no right or wrong here. You know, it, it depends on your cafe and your sense of it. Ways to share. So um, this person has a moment of silence at the cafe when somebody has died. But they say if, if the person didn't die but moved to an assisted living and doesn't come for that reason, they wouldn't routinely announce it only if the spouse said to do so. Um, and, you know, just parenthetically, people can obviously still come if they move um, or if they're in the day program, et cetera. But sometimes it gets harder, and sometimes it's just better for the person not to be taken out and taken, you know, here and there. So. I'm sure we all find that folks, many folks do drift away from attending after they move to assisted living. Um, the last comment here, we use constant contact for a monthly e-newsletter. When there's a death, we send a special notification to the list with a link to the obituary. So there's a lot of variety out there in how people are doing it. This is from my cafe. So I have a hanging cloth on our creative clothesline, as we call it, of artwork for a long time. And I thought this would be something that a care partner could come back to the cafe and do, is put the initials on in the heart. And very few people do it. Uh, I don't know if it's that they don't notice it um, or, or what it is, but it doesn't get heavily used. But I still like having it there just mm -hmm. as a physical representation. And it says on it, thinking of those who will always be part of the JF and CS Memory Cafe community. So it's meant to include people who've died as well as people who've moved or just can't come for other reasons. Next month, no, November, two months, we're going to try something for the first time, which is having a reunion. And um, so it's going to take place at our regular cafe. But I'm going to reach out to the care partners whose person is no longer, you know, has died or no longer able to attend, and just invite them all back, thinking that if there's a time that they think they may see some of those familiar faces, they'll be more likely. And I've talked with several people about it who are planning to come. So we shall see. I'll be happy to share how that goes with you when it happens. But I just booked our cafe room extra hour so that if they wanted, they could stay at the end and chat. And then I'm doing it on at a session where the activity that's already happening seems appropriate. We have a, a Shanaki coming, who's a traditional Irish storyteller, and he does this wonderful stuff about gratitude and heritage, and it seems like it would be a nice theme for the reunion. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so one other point is that sometimes people need referrals to other supports, bereavement groups, or other kinds of activities. So a couple of folks talk, talked about that. And then I want to just zero in on a few quotes about the impact of sharing um, and then really see if we can have some more discussion. Um, so. This quote, some reach out to the care partner with a card or call. This is a very caring community, and when someone stops coming, the group notices, and they want to know how they can be helpful. So it's important to keep in mind that when people are living with a chronic disability, they often become just the care recipient, and they need the opportunity to do things for others as well. And sometimes the group really has a need to be of support to their peers, and it feels really good and important to them. This person says, I think it's important to acknowledge the progression of the disease and to acknowledge the transition of fellow cafe guests. Mm -hmm. The memory cafe guests are on a journey together and they become like family. And then another quote says, most don't notice it. So obviously one size does not fit all. It depends on your cafe, depends on how long it's been running, how it's structured, is it large or small? Um, you know, it's, it's going to vary. 
And then this person says, our group is very loyal to one another. They all try to make it to the wake and the funeral. They encourage the care partner to continue to come to the group as they are their support circle. We also send a group card and informally rotate check-ins um, by uh, both facilitators and members. So this is a very bonded group with a very interactive, mutually supportive structure. And there's a real recognition here of the fact that when someone either has, when their person dies or when they move, often that person has that additional secondary loss of their support group. Mm -hmm. um, you know, suddenly they don't fit at the memory cafe anymore. They don't fit at the caregiver support group. And so um, that can be really tough. So that's, it sounds like that's working well for this group. And the next one says, we try to make the group as normal as possible to create a similar response of people's circle of friends prior to dementia. We don't want them to feel kicked to the curb. The members want to support them knowing full well they could be next. So they treat those ahead of them on the journey with great love, respect, and dignity. So I'm sure you've all seen this in you know, support groups and settings like that, how amazing people can be in taking their own pain and challenges and really relating to one another and in that finding a sense of meaning in what they're suffering. So um, I love these comments because I feel like these folks are giving people a chance to really find that in themselves. Um, and yet, there's some other important issues. This person points out their capacity issues about how to provide acknowledgement and support directly or to train volunteers to develop the necessary skills. So it's kind of like you can't take the lid off all those emotions if you don't have enough support folks in the room to kind of facilitate that. Um, and there's a balance there. I know for myself, I don't do phone calls to people. I don't have the capacity. Um, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> you know, we all, we all have to sort of pick and choose what we're able to do. The next person points out it's never easy and one size is not at all. And finally, and I, I think Lori's still on the line here. Um, this is from Lori LeBay, who started one of the country's very first memory cafes in Roseville, Minnesota, which is still going. And Lori, I'm sure Many of you know her resources and her um, Alzheimer's Speaks radio show and all these other things that she does, but she then very generously is offering to talk with anybody about this issue. And she says, I think it's up to the facilities to lead with compassion and the member, members will follow suit. Death is a normal part of aging and avoiding the topic does not help anyone. It's be a beautiful thing to see your group come together to lift one another up during hard times with celebrating the good times. If anyone wants to talk to me, feel free to reach out. And I'm just going to see, Lori, if you're still on the line, I'll unmute you in case you want to actually say anything about that. See if I can do this. There you are. Hi, Lori. Whoops. <laughs> I don't know why that's not working. All right, I'm going to just unmute everybody. <laughs> didn't unmute, it didn't unmute her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Poor. Oh, oh, she my. unmuted herself. Oh, I'm, maybe that's why. All right, Lori, are you there? You want to say anything? I hear a little sound. <laughs> Right. You, you can you can um, chat us if you want to because we're just not hearing you. But you don't have to. I think your comment said it all. Does anybody else on the line want to make a comment? Okay, so I'm going to read one of the chats which says, I am impressed with this level of support. So probably responding to one of those earlier quotes about um, really, really coming together. Hard to do. In my experience with all volunteers facilitating a cafe, so absolutely. And volunteers may really not have the expertise to um, feel comfortable 
addressing um, some of these issues. So what about um, what about other folks? Comments, questions? I think I think that was pretty much it in terms of the slides. Summing up, yeah. So again, you know, summing up, it's important to get permission to share information. It can be really helpful to everyone to acknowledge the loss, even if it's difficult. Um, folks may need referrals. That's another important role. And by the way, and especially for volunteer-run cafes, you can always have them call the Alzheimer's Association helpline and get referrals anywhere in the country. So you don't have to do that yourself if that isn't part of the infrastructure of your organization. But finally, one size does not fit all. So um, there won't be the same approach for any two cafes or any two individuals, really. Anybody want to make comments about this? Are we all tired? We <laughs> <laughs> got one. Oh yeah, please go ahead. Please. Um, hi, um, we have not started our cafe yet, but we're uh, about to. Um, and so, in thinking of it, you know, part of the reason we're here is to kind of be pleasant and soak up a lot of your um, your experiences. Um, and I think that both of us had we we talked about the actual cafe and what we thought it would look like. We had not thought of this, I know I had, um, talked about this communication piece. And so I guess I'd like to kind of ask the group, um, is, is, are your cafes drop-ins? Are you having any kind of registration process? What kind of information do you gather if people just drop in? Do you take names or emails? Or Because obviously there's a piece to this that I hadn't um, even really thought about. So just mm -hmm. love to hear some feedback about that from the group. Yeah. Absolutely. So one piece of the attendance puzzle is when people do come, you absolutely want them to come back. Mm -hmm. So you need some mechanism to maintain communication. So does anybody want to respond to um Kirsten's question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh Karen. Yeah. I get the phone numbers and the email and uh and I do a robocall, and uh, I'll do it like in the beginning of the week. We have our, our cafe on Thursday, so I'll do it on Monday, and the call will go out to anybody's phone number I have. And it's just, uh, and it's everybody who's ever been to the cafe, because I don't know if they've dropped out, why they've dropped out, they just haven't come, or if they are coming, it's just a reminder, uh, and just you know, let them know that they're invited to come and what the date and time is. Uh, and I also do it with a blanket email. It just goes out. It looks like an invitation, but it's anybody who's ever come who's given me their email address, and there's no requirement to RSVP. I just ask that if possible, please RSVP. But it's not a requirement. So it's just kind of the uh, my cafe is coming Thursday, week from today. So I sent out an email today, and the phone call will go out on Monday. So some of them get both. Uh, some of them only have a phone number and no email. So uh, try and cover everybody. And we'll, we'll get about 20 people to, um, to the cafe each time, but they're not always the same 20 people. So it shows me that that method, reaching out not just to the people that were there last month, uh, but people who may have been there three or four months ago and mm -hmm. just gave me their contact information once, um, and maybe sort of other times they just haven't been available, but now they are. So it's kind of a reminder. Great, thank you. Thank you. Sue, did you want to respond? We, we have a volunteer man um, a, a registration table where we also keep other materials for other memory cafes around, you know, the whole list of the whole state of Massachusetts pretty much. Um, we do a monthly uh, email newsletter and um, we seem to be getting different people that way too. I have a facilitator who does a lot of networking. I mean, a lot of networking. And um, the word gets out, but basically we have a signed liability forms, photo release forms. Um, we do it in our senior center, so we're a municipality. You know, I'm bound by rules and regulations of my town too. But um, that's basically how we keep track of everybody's names and phone numbers. Thank you. 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 Thank
countries um, and I can give you links to those if you're interested um, but so memory cafes and, you know if you're applying for grants you can't call them an evidence-based program you could call them perhaps evidence supported yeah. but we are it seems moving more and more into a situation where there are requirements for a lot of funders especially the bigger funders that are looking for evidence-based intervention so I think you know, it would be great if, if this person wants to. And um, there's a lot of memory cafe people around the country, myself included, that are really hoping at some point to, um, that a, a funder and a, an academically based researcher will take this on, will pair together and take this on. I think it's a great research project just waiting to happen. That said, once you have something evidence-based, it means if you're trying to show that you're going to get the same outcomes, you feel a little pressure to adhere to the same approach. Mm -hmm. So it can be a little bit of a straight jacket as well. So, you know, what we have now is a social movement and it's wonderfully free. You know, what is a memory cafe? It's different in each community and there's a lot of beauty to that too. So I'm going to suggest that we close the meeting for now, but if folks want to stay in chat, I have the room till 3.30, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, folks on the line, thank you so much for being with us around the country. Thank you for bearing with any technical imperfections, shall we say. And thank you again to the wonderful team at SS. Thank you for, for, for coming and sharing with us. And we'll hope to see you all back again December 12th.
Thank you for your presentation. That was great. 